Hello and welcome to the new season, season five of the Page One podcast. I'm Tarek. I'm Marco. Yes, we've made it to season five somehow. I'm not not quite sure People how that's happened. People said cancelled after one. Well, where <laughs> are they now? That's the good thing about being your own publisher. You, you, you don't <laughs> yeah, get to be cancelled. take that, Marco. I told you would make it past the first time. Um, if this is your first episode of the Page One podcast, thanks very much for joining us on the Page One podcast. We like to speak to writers of all kinds. Uh, authors, screenwriters, journalists, comic book writers, all kinds of writers about how they got into the industry, speak about their writing process, uh, their work and try and get as many hints and tips as possible. And uh, we're starting this season off with a great guest. We do indeed. This week we are chatting with Mr Alistair Campbell, uh, best known perhaps as a chief strategist for Tony Blair. Uh, He has also done a lot of work outside politics. He's written a number of best-selling fiction and non-fiction books, including The Blair Years, Winners. Um, he does a lot of work for mental health charities. He's a mind champion of the year, which sounds like he may have some kind of telekinesis. I'm not quite <laughs> sure what that means. <laughs> I don't but... think that's what that is. <laughs> yeah, and his latest book uh, is Living Better, uh, How I Learned to Survive Depression, which is his story about his... Uh, very well publicised and lifelong struggle with depression, um, which we chat to him about. And he's very open and very keen, I think, to, to chat about this and get it out there and let people know it's it's not only cathartic for him, but it helps others as well, I think. And yeah. It is an important yeah. subject to cover. Um, but Absolutely. we also, as you say, Tarek, talked to him about his time in politics, his time, how he moved from journalism into politics. And obviously... Around that, there is a little bit of political chat, but we we keep it on the writing front rather than rather than straying too far. I hope, um, and then also his fiction work, which I think a lot of people don't know that he's written fiction books. He also does, still does journalism, does lots of writing, has so many ideas. It seems. Yes, uh, he has an amazing bit towards the end where he literally rattles off ideas. You know, he shows you how you come up with ideas on the spot and it's it's it, it does yeah. show that there's that kind of waiting for an idea to strike isn't really true it's yeah. you have to go and just make you, it and it's you see the ideas are all around yeah you. exactly if you're in, the, in the right mindset you can pluck that idea out then yeah. yeah definitely um so uh, that's enough from us we'll get straight into the podcast uh, after a brief advert for our writer's notebook which is available uh, at the link in the bio and then we'll be back at the end of the podcast with a bit more chat and to let you know about next week's guest who's another great one on with the podcast the blank page to some it's terrifying an obstacle to overcome but we prefer to think of it as an opportunity a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying, or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made Page One. Page One is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project, divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realised you need to plan how to let people read it. So we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, 
Every story starts with page one. I think you started out in, in journalism in terms of writing. Was was that something that you always wanted to do when you were growing up? Was was journalism the goal or was ending up working in politics the goal ultimately? Uh, neither of them were, to be right. honest. Okay. I didn't really have a clue. I think I, I think my first recollection of, of writing, other than stuff that you did at school, was when I was about nine. My dad had a very bad accident. He was a vet and he, he ended up in hospital. And it wasn't like today where you can visit when you want and, and all that. We could hardly see him at all. Mm-hmm. So I used to write these really long, detailed letters about my day. And I used to copy things out of the newspapers. I used to give him football reports and all this sort of stuff. And I always enjoyed just getting a pen or a pencil and committing to print. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's my first kind of really active memory of it. And I used to write songs when I was a kid, and I used to write poems. And I've always, I've always written a lot, um, but there was no kind of journalism in my, in my family. There was um, a cousin of my dad who was a uh, uh, worked in, I think it was a BBC Scotland. Mm-hmm. There was, um, uh, you know, the, the, there'd been a kind of couple of books way, way back in the past from sort of previous generations, but. Um, and the politics thing was wasn't really in my childhood either. So, no, I, I don't. I honestly, if you'd have said to me when I was, you know, that that age, when I was, a, you know, still at primary school, oh, you'll probably be a journalist, and then you you'll do something in politics. And I said, well, I don't see why it's just not going to happen. But, but I can see what the the writing thing was always very very yeah. important. And and so how is it that you did end up then becoming a journalist? You know, what what was the path that, that led to that then? Well, I know this is going to sound really, really weird, but I honestly don't remember. Um, I went to university. I did languages. I had a year abroad. I I was a busker playing the bagpipes, going around Europe, and you know I did okay. My first. I'm 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 neither proud nor ashamed of this, but my, my very first publication, as it were, was um, a series that I wrote for Forum magazine. Right. Um, which I think we call an adult entertainment uh, <laughs> magazine. Uh, and, and then I kind of I finished, so I did languages, French and German. And, and again, I think, you know, the word, the thing about words was very kind of central to everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I just sort of stumbled upon, I had a kind of year messing around really. And then I stumbled upon an advert for the Mirror Group training scheme and I applied for it. Um, but I don't ever remember thinking I really, really want to be a journalist. I, it was more that I, I just liked writing. I just liked, you know, I used to, I used to write kind of stuff that was never intended for publication. I yeah. used to write stuff that was. Yeah. It's just something I've always done. And then, well, then what drew you then from from that point in, into into the politics world? What what, what made the jump? Uh, I mean, the the, the, the kind of the practical, factual answer is that uh, John Smith, when he was leader of the Labour Party, died. Tony Blair took over, and Tony, who I knew through, journal- you know, being a political journalist by then, mm. he asked me to work for him. That's the practical, factual answer. Um, I think the the kind of longer and and more you know accurate answer is that having gone into journalism, having um, then gone into political journalism, I just, I kind of became more and more political. Um, and I was getting a little bit bored with journalism. I'd been, you know, it's that thing when you, oh, it's another Tory party conference. Oh, it's another Labour party conference. Oh, it's another speech. It was, I was slightly getting that feeling. Mm-hmm. And I was actually thinking of going into politics myself. Um, and then the Tony thing happened. And um, I said no at first. In fact, I up with you know, in France now, he, he came out here we, when we were on holiday and uh, sort of talked me into it. Um, but again, that was very much, you know, it's about writing. I mean, politics, a lot of it is about words. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and partic- particularly in opposition. I mean, the cam- you know, campaigning is about, it's about what you're saying and how you're saying it. And so, um, so that was that was that was what happened. Really, it was a combination of him thinking that I had the skills to give him a kind of, you know, maybe a, a more str- strategic approach to stuff. 
knew the media world inside out, good with words, all that. Um, you know, we, we were pretty effective. You know, we, we ran a very effective operation. But that, so that, that was how it happened. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the, the background in journalism has, has helped with that. But the writing, the writing side of it, what was the difference between, you know, doing political journalism and then moving into sort of actually working in politics? How does how does that writing change in any way? That's a good question. I, it's funny enough, I, I mentioned John Smith there. I can remember when Neil Kinnock was leader of the Labour Party, people used to say to him a lot, God, you should get Alistair Campbell. I was on the mirror then. You should get Alistair Campbell to do your media. He's the guy for that. And, you know, he's very Labour and blah, blah, blah. And Neil kind of thought about it. I remember when John Smith was leader, I remember John, John Smith saying it. He's very kind of, you know, blunt, straightforward way. He said, I don't think you'd be very good at, in politics. So what? He said, well, you've got two sorts of people, <clears throat> really, in this kind of world that we're in. You've got people who disclose and people who conceal. Journalists are all about disclosure. And sometimes in politics, you have to conceal. <laughs> 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 Which I thought was a kind of... So that's. So I think that the big change was that you were you was you were writing now. Some of the stuff you were writing for publication, mm -hmm. but in the main, the stuff that I would have been writing was you know papers on ideas yeah. and uh, plans and that kind of thing. And now, the the one thing I'd say that I think helped me having been a journalist is that. I used to have a, a thing on my wall in, in, in opposition. It said it was life is on the record. And it was a way of saying whatever you say, whatever you write, whatever you do, it can get out there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I was always a part of me when I was writing kind of policy notes and what have you, was always conscious of the fact, even if you didn't expect it to be published, it might be. Yeah. Yeah. So and I think the discipline of having been a, a particularly a tabloid political journalist where sometimes, you know, you literally get told, you know, when some huge events happened, you say you put 350 words or, you know, if you're lucky at the mirror, you'd get a thousand. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but that discipline of, of kind of making every word count was, was something that, that I kind of, I think did take successfully from journalism into into politics and the other thing that I, I wrote one of my books i wrote a few years ago called winners mm -hmm. which is an analysis of winning in sport and business and politics and i can't remember which chapter it's in but i i, I use this line from marilyn monroe and marilyn monroe wrote this poem called think in ink and i've always done that and 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 so what i when i was writing often um, and I think you see this maybe in some of the stuff that I write journalistically today. I've written a piece today about Johnson and COVID, about the mm -hmm. thousand pieces I've done. But I almost kind of, I'm thinking my way through what I'm going to say as yeah. I'm writing it. And, mm -hmm. and that process is, is, I think, is useful in politics. It's like, you know, you're basically saying, well, here's where we are. Here's how we're trying, here's where we're trying to get to. Mm -hmm. Here are the steps that I think we have to take. And you literally set them out as steps, almost like chapter one, chapter two, chapter mm -hmm. three. Yeah. If we do this, this, if we do this, this. And that process of thinking in ink, I, I don't think people in politics do it nearly enough. No, I think that's probably true, actually. I mean, and how, how involved were you in, in writing speeches and things like that for for Tony Blair? And, you know, how many pairs of hands would a political speech, an important political speech, pass through? Uh I was very involved, mm -hmm. and, and I mean, how many hands? Again, that's that's. It, it would depend. Um, but so, for example, this time of year now in the summer, this would be the time of year that we start to think about the conference speech in the autumn. So, and the process would tend to be discussion, kind of, you know, what we're trying to do, what's mm -hmm. the purpose, what's the mood, what's the context, and then. Um, start to write, and I, and I guess in the early days, the the kind of I, I would be one of three people probably that were the main writers of it: uh, David Miliband, Peter Hyman. Um, we'd be kind of writing stuff. So Tony would quite often he'd be writing stuff as well, obviously, and he would sometimes would phone up and say, "How are you getting on?" and "What are you thinking?" and 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 then what would happen was we'd we'd probably then put a a proper draft together once we're all back in the same place. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, there's a bit, 
I mean, the process of speech writing was just at times a nightmare because, but it, but it was kind of, it was Tony's way of, he wouldn't accept that it was the best that it could be until about a minute before it had to be delivered. <laughs> it was always like, you know, we can, we can improve this. That's not right. We can change this. And, and it could be a nightmare. But, and sometimes I think it meant that you did maybe lose things that we shouldn't have lost. Mm -hmm. But it did also mean that in general, we did improve it. Mm -hmm. um, and but there's there's a bit in my diaries where I can't remember which speech it was, but it was like, you know, it was like two, three nights on the trot where we're working through the night. Um, and I can remember this. I can remember this bud speech where I can't remember if we were in government. I think we were in government. And we went to stay at this guy's house, um, and he had this big, uh, you know, just sort of get away from the office. And Tony and I were we were up in this house. He was in one room, I was in the other. We were sort of meeting every hour to go through what we'd been doing. And and um, he says, should we, should we, you know, and we, we sort of hit a block, and we went for a walk, and we're looking out in this. We're, we're sort of in sort of North London, almost countryside, but there are these cows and sheep out in the field. And he says, do you know what? I'd really, really, really like to be that cow. <laughs> <laughs> that, that cow doesn't know who we are, doesn't have a speech to write, doesn't care, just waiting to go and get milked. <laughs> so he, but he, he's, um, you know, Tony's an interesting sort of writer. He's got a very, he's, he's actually, I mean, his book, The Journey, he, you know, he, obviously showed it to lots of people me included but he, it was very much his kind of writing mm -hmm. um and he does have a very maybe a more old-fashioned style than people might might imagine but the 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 political speech writing was was interesting because as he got more experienced he became and and he, towards the end even though we'd all be contributing and we'd all be drafting and what have you the final products tended to be much more him Right. Okay. Whereas I think back in the early days, maybe, you know, you used, I remember some of the papers used to kind of try to analyze what line would mm -hmm. I have written? What, yeah. You know, and it, was, it was that sort of nonsense. But, but it was, so they were, they were very, they were team efforts. A big speech is a team mm -hmm. effort. Um, but Tony, Tony's a pen and paper guy. He likes to just sort of sit down and, you know, he doesn't type. He just longhand and gives it a go. And does the does the background in journalism, you know, this give me three hundred and fifty words on this topic or whatever, that that sort of strict deadline, does that help when you're in politics as well, when you've got to make a statement or a speech on something? That that sort so. of trains you into that yeah, mindset. I think so. I think I think one of the things that that I was able to I remember Philip Gould in his book, he said that, you know, he'd never met anybody like me that could that could think up kind of lines that encapsulated arguments really really quickly mm -hmm. um and i do think that's important i think that you you know and uh, i guess you know new labor was that was 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 if you like the, 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 an example of that yeah. where we were i remember we were uh, tony's first speech as leader we knew that he was going to announce a change of the labor party's constitution and we were talking about the backdrop on the conference, you know, the thing that they put behind yeah. the the podium. And um, uh, and the, the plan was it was going to be Labour's new approach. And we just sort of, well, it's all right. It's OK. And I can remember scribbling. In fact, I've got this piece of paper somewhere at home, just sort of scribbling different sort of thoughts and what have you. And this meeting just saying, well, look, you know what, it was just, Call it what it is. Call it new labour. Mm -hmm. And it was like even Peter Mandelson, who was like right on the kind of you know right out there as a kind of moderniser. Yeah. Are, are we going a bit fast? And what's I remember we had a discussion about whether it would get booed. Mm -hmm. You know, because there was a uh, now as it happened, it went fine. Mm -hmm. um, but so that so that was that that and and then things like you know if if uh, I always think like you know for a headline. Um, you don't want to go to the headline first, but once you've got a core argument, there's nothing wrong then in sitting down and saying, right, if you've got one word that's allowed to describe this, what's the word? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you've got a phrase, what's the phrase? If you've got a sentence, what's the sentence? And and I used to kind of do that with everything we did. Mm -hmm. um, and 
I, you know, I said in the winner's book that I think a good strategy, you should be able to encapsulate it in a word, a phrase, a sentence, a paragraph, a page, a speech and a book. Yeah. But is there a danger in modern politics that that that, that obsession with a phrase become, you know, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to get too much into this, but obviously with Brexit and everything like that, you get you get things like get Brexit done and Brexit means mm. Brexit and all these. And they they become almost meaningless, but because they're trotted out so much, mm. it's all, you know, it's well, the sort of it gets in everyone's head, you know. Mm. I mean, I would say this, wouldn't I? I would differentiate between the sort of phraseology that we did, like New Labour, New Britain, mm. that and some of the stuff that this lot come out with, particularly actually not just in Brexit, but also in relation to COVID. Mm. I mean, you know, day after day after day, there's a new kind of three-word line, mm -hmm. you know, wash your hands, don't go to work, do go to work, don't wear a mask, do wear a mask. You know, these kind of messaging that's been all over the place, but all driven with this kind of the same intensity. I would like to think that our messaging actually was both embedded in but also flowed from the policy and the strategy that we were trying to pursue. Mm -hmm. I think with this lot, I don't actually think they've got a clue about what they want to do, um, both with Brexit and with COVID. Mm -hmm. So get Brexit done, you know, leave means leave, uh, take back control, well, take back control, what, is, what has that actually meant in practice? Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. has get Brexit done meant in practice? We knew when we said we're fighting as new, we're going to run as new Labour and govern as new Labour, we, we knew what that meant in policy terms. Yeah. I think there's a difference. Yeah, it's almost like here, here are phrases that we that we can give to people to repeat and sort of get into their tribal stance and just say, you know, you see it on social media, it just gets repeated mm. without any sort of thought as to what, what it means, as you say. Yeah. That, that seems yeah. to be what what the yeah. difference is but and it, I, funny enough we were talking at lunchtime my, 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 one of my sons said that you know something's happened in the last few years we were trying to work out when it kind of when it sort of flipped from a place where you know politics is quite a tough place and people maybe push right to the edges of what they can and can't do but when have we moved to a place where now if you look at america you look at britain with Johnson, Trump, America, Putin in Russia, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Duterte in the Philippines, Orban in Hungary. You can go around the world, and it seems to be that the public, large swathes of the public in those countries, they don't actually mind if their politicians brazenly lie. Mm. Now, I think that's a relatively new thing. Yeah, I know we got accused of lying the whole time. I would argue that we didn't. Uh, and in fact, we, you know, I, I know because I mean, my job as Tony's spokesman, I used to, I can remember I used to, whenever I was preparing for a briefing, <clears throat> I always used to, in my head, if I was unsure about something or if I thought I wasn't happy about something, the kind of factual basis that I was speaking on, and I'd be asking for more work and more research, whatever. But the, in my head, I had, if Tony Blair at the dispatch box is not allowed to say something that's untrue, then as his spokesman in the briefing room, I have to take the same approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Johnson has no qualms at all. Mm -hmm. You know, he said something last week about, about Keir Starmer. You know, he, he never said anything about the, the Salisbury killings, right? Well, just straightforwardly untrue. Mm -hmm. A few weeks before that, straightforwardly untrue about the child poverty figures straightforwardly untrue about the local authorities having access to all the data on COVID. I mean, every single week at Prime Minister's Questions, he says something that's untrue. And there seems to me to be very little fuss about it. When you think that, you know, we st I still get, what are we, 20, 17 years after the Iraq war, I still get the whole kind of dossier, 45 minutes thing thrown at me every single day. Yeah. And I was like the spokesman. Johnson's the prime minister, lies systematically and gets no comeback. Well, I, I kind of wondered about that. Like, you know, when you when you write something for yourself 
that you are either going to put into print in a paper or into a book, and then you're writing something for someone else to see, such as the PM, etc. When you when you when you're writing them something to say, and they have to, and they have to make an important point, whether it's a launch or it's a rebuttal to something, is there a part of you that's that that you know you you can only do so much? The word on the on 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 the page is only so much. The rest, but you have to have trust that they'll take the words that you've written and actually turn it into an eloquent argument or say it properly and not fluff the lines. And is there a part of you that kind of worries about how that line will be said to, or how it will be received? Yeah, that, that that's. I mean, the thing about I remember when um, uh, David Axelrod, who worked for Obama, when he was over helping Ed Miliband. And David and I went out for went out for dinner, and and he made the point. He said, you know, the thing is about people like you and me. He said, we were kind of blessed, right? I worked for Barack Obama. You worked for Tony Blair. Those guys know how to communicate, and there is something in that that you know. It, I I didn't feel with Tony. I mean, I, mean, I, I like to think that the advice that I gave and the stuff that I wrote, I like to think that helped him do the job that he did, both as opposition leader and as prime minister. Mm -hmm. But I never thought this guy kind of can't do this job. Um, whereas, you know, I think there are some people, I suspect that the wretched Cummings does sit there thinking, you know, I have to be here and I have to take all this power to myself because I don't think this guy Johnson can do the job. He may think that, I don't know. But I never thought that with Tony. Axelrod never thought that with, Ob with Obama. Um, but yeah, for sure, you never you never know. You honestly never know how something is going to land. I mean, I can't give you any specific examples off the top of my head, but if I if I plowed through my diaries, I'd find lots of examples of, of times where we worked really really hard on a speech or an argument. Actually, what get picked up and what got taken by the media and cemented in the kind of public mind as that was the point of that speech. It was something completely yeah. different. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll give you, you know, I'll give you another example. I regularly get asked, um, was it you or Tony who described uh, princess Diana as the people's princess, right? I get asked that all the time. And the, <laughs> the honest answer is I have got no memory of any discussion about it at all. <laughs> And so you go back, what you do in those, you know, I've, as you know, I've published my diaries. In my diary, there is one line, right? It, Tony and I are talking through the night, and it, there's one line. It said, we agreed it was okay to call her the people's princess. That's the one discussion. Mm. Now, I can, now the next day, he did his thing outside the church in Sedgefield, and, you know, the words did get the moment and the mood right. He did deliver them really, really well. Um, I can remember I was at home in London watching it on the television. And I remember, I think it was David Meller, the former Tory cabinet minister. I think he was in, at the time in the studio. And they went from Tony's little speech outside the church to David Meller. And he just, he said something like to the work, to the effect of, Oh my God, that was brilliant. It was that sort of thing. Yeah. And, but the thing is, you don't know that's going to happen. No. Yeah. yeah. And so something like, I can imagine the reason why we probably, you know, me writing in my diary, we agreed it was okay to call her the people's princess. That means we've had the discussion about that. Mm. Right. Now, I don't remember the discussion, but if I think about what we've probably discussed, I think it would be two things. Would it be a bit, mm, a bit yuck? You know, is that a bit over yeah. the top? Mm -hmm. yeah. And secondly, I suspect we would have had the discussion, is there a danger in saying that, that people think we're saying she's not the people's queen, he's not the people's mm -hmm. prince of Wales, he's mm -hmm. not the people, you know, are we differentiating? Or was there a kind of quasi-political element there? I imagine that's the discussion. Yeah. And anyway, so the next day, the reason the, the, I'll tell you what I knew, absolutely, that line was one of those lines that was going to kind of just you know, be part of the language yep. uh, going forward, was the Daily Mail, which is not a paper that was ever very nice about us, they had the words, the people's princess, on the top of every page, and they carried it on for weeks. Mm -hmm. And the International Herald Tribune, which is, you know, one of the most important papers in the world, 
their headline was world mourns people's princess yeah. and so you sort of know but that as i say there are other times when you maybe you've got a, what you think is an amazing line yeah you've got yeah. you've written this speech and they're gonna that's what they're gonna take and it just doesn't happen yeah and i was i was actually going to ask about the diaries because obviously you've, you've published uh, i think is it seven volumes along with the blair years as well eight so eight, 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 eight is nine. about to drop right okay <laughs> and uh, you know what is the what is the process in writing those diaries you know obviously you're going through the the, the actual diaries but do you have to run them past people beforehand or anything like that or are they just oh, for publication you, yeah. yeah yeah you do mm -hmm. um so i mean the process of writing the diary is it funny enough i'm much less disciplined now than i was mm -hmm. i used to be incredibly disciplined and i think there's two reasons for that one back then particularly when i was in doing the job in 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 for tony blair it was almost like a therapy for me at the end of every day I've got to just dump this now. It's like an emotional dump, and I just do it. Mm -hmm. um, and what's more, I did it all with a pen. Mm -hmm. I've become much more, most of my writing now I'm doing on, on here, on the mm -hmm. laptop, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. including including my diary. Uh, funny enough, I'm probably, publisher will probably slag me off for saying this, but I don't think, I don't think it's as good <laughs> when you just sort of bang it up <laughs> um, and I've become less disciplined about it. I think I think it's a really strange thing. Um, and and funny enough, during this period, this whole lockdown period, I've been writing tons of stuff. I've written books. I've written. I wrote a huge piece about mental health for tortoise. I've written. Uh, I've finished a novel. I've I've, I've uh, rewritten a book about mental health that's coming out in. September, I've written in the hundreds of articles and blogs and stuff for different parts of the world about COVID. And yet, I've been very, not very disciplined at all about doing a diary mm -hmm. during this period. And I don't know what that's about. I think maybe sometimes there's, there's only so much sort of writing space for you. I do write a lot. I write, I mean, today I've written a piece for The Independent. I've written a piece for the article website. I've written a note for a prime minister in not Boris Johnson, I hasten to add, in a different part of the world that I, you know, do stuff for. Um, and and I've also been writing a, a, a plan for the publication of the of the depression book. So I mean I write all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but I've got less disciplined about the diaries. Sorry, I've gone way off beam there. Your question is about the <laughs> publication. No, what happened with that was um, you do have to I mean could I have not done it maybe but I think it's difficult and also I I wanted to I didn't want to cause more trouble that I mean the, I knew the diaries are going to cause a bit of trouble anyway I didn't want them to cause any more trouble than as it were mm -hmm. they had to um and I mean the system has changed now because the personnel have changed but my process was that there's a woman who was in the cabinet office she now works in Northern Ireland but she called Sue Gray and she she was the person you went to with the book. And she would then decide who had to read what bits. Right. Okay. So it would go to the intelligence agencies, it'd go to the MOD, it'd go to the Foreign Office, it'd go to the Royal Family, to the Palace. Um, I did let Tony Blair read everything. Um, and I and I also I did say to him, listen, you know, this is about you as much as it is about me. If there's stuff in there you don't like, you just tell me. Mm -hmm. And yep. I'm not going to make. I'm not going to be difficult. Um, and funnily enough, he was he was much more worried. I mean, there's some stuff. There's some stuff in there. I was amazed that he didn't just put a red pen through, right? <laughs> um, uh, but for example, I remember I, I had this. I saw a really good, interesting, funny passage about Boris Yeltsin when he was pissed. <laughs> and I remember Tony said, oh, don't do that. Don't do that. It's really, it's really, it's really not nice. He doesn't need that. As he's dead. <laughs> yeah, but he doesn't, he doesn't need that. And so it was, it was things like that. And, and things like, you know, some of the language. <laughs> Am I allowed to swear at you? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So there's this there's this bit where 
uh, again, not far from where I am now when during the during the, the, the build up to the Hutton inquiry, when I was asked for my diaries, which was which was a really horrible moment, I've got to tell you. That was <laughs> that was such a bad moment in my life. I mean I couldn't it was it was like a PS on the note. It was a note telling me when I was due to, when I had to give evidence, what I'd be asked about. Mm-hmm. And it was like a, literally a PS. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I can give you word for word because it's seared on my memory. It said, Lord Hutton has noted in the media that you keep a personal diary. He would like to see this diary insofar as it relates to the remit of his investigation. It was, I, honestly, I was winded. I was absolutely winded. And the thing was, the diaries were in London. I'm in France. My poor mother in law had to go and get them from the house, get deliver them to somebody in number 10. They got flown out by a duty clerk. I had to go and pick them up. I, I wrote about this in my diaries. It's the only time in my life when I really honestly was close to just driving the car off the road and thinking, fuck it, let's just end the whole damn lot. I'm sick to death of this. And anyway, got the diaries. And from then on, Tony was just relentless. What's in them? What's the worst thing? Mm-hmm. Da, da, da. Mm-hmm. And I said, Tony, look, Alison, my secretary, she's coming out. We're going to transcribe them. I'm going to go through them with the lawyer. He's going to decide, Jonathan Sumption, who was my QC, he's going to decide what is, you know, has to be given and what doesn't, what is within the guy's remit. Um, and we're just going to have to trust him. And Tony was like, every 10 minutes, what's in it, what's in it? So anyway, <laughs> there's this one bit where he says, is there much swearing? I said, yeah, quite a lot. <laughs> he said, what's the worst? I said, Cunt, probably. <laughs> he goes, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so that sort of stuff, he didn't seem to mind. But uh-huh. <laughs> other stuff he minded. And, and, and I wondered when, you, when you're going through all these piles of papers and you're, and you're trying to decide what to, what to put in the final books, um, you know, how do you decide what to put in and what to leave out? And do you try to kind of create a narrative through line to take people through the years? Is that an important part of it or is it just I mean I think what happened as it happened what what was interesting about when I first transcribed it for as it were for publication as opposed to the only transcription I'd done prior to that was for that yeah inquiry and I know people laughed at the literally some of the journalists laughed at the inquiry when I said that I've kept the diary all my life and this was not intended you know it wasn't intended for publication what I meant by that is that when I've been keeping a diary I've never thought you know, one day I'm going to publish this. It's just mm-hmm. something I've always done. Um, and when it came to the publication process, no, I don't think I was. I don't think I was shaping a narrative because it was very much a question simply of of of. If I mean, if I had published everything, you know, it's eight volumes already, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what the publisher wanted for the first one, the Blair years, was the kind of extracts. Um, because they wanted that done, you know, reasonably quickly. I was very open about the fact that I kept out anything that I thought would be damaging to Gordon Brown, who was going to be taken over as prime minister. Um, but it was more that I I wanted to keep in enough that gave people a sense of what went on and what it was like. And also, I didn't want it just to be all about the politics. So I wanted to... You know, football's important to me, Mm -hmm. family's important to me. I wanted all that to be in there. I probably kept in maybe more of the personal stuff than than Fiona, my partner, would have wanted. But again, I thought that was I thought that was important to to be honest about the difficulties that we had as a result of the pressures of the job and that sort of thing. And because I'd said from the outset, one day I'm gonna publish the lot, Mm -hmm. I was less worried about, you know. The editing process and and also i had you know back to the point about tabloid journalists that my, my editor was richard stott who'd been my editor at the mirror mm-hmm. he'd actually been my boss um and he had a really good eye i think for and then when he died bill haggerty who'd been my editor at the sunday mirror he he took over um and he's still he's still doing them now and so i don't it's a, it's a tough question that because I'd have to kind of go through that, relive that process. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, you know, I think sometimes it's, you just, 
there were, there, I remember the parts of the editing process when I'd say to Richard or to Bill, I said, listen, I'm bored with this. So, you know, and I'm, I'm quite interested in it. So <laughs> what's it going to be like for, you know, you can't keep going on. I mean, I remember when the reviews came, people said, you know, do we really need to know about another row between Tony Blair and Gordon Brown? Well, no, you don't, because people know that happened. Mm -hmm. But I think that's one of the the themes that when it came to publishing the full versions, I felt it was important to have that, that there. Yeah. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, there's no science to it, is there? You just kind yeah. of, you know, and, and, and there's no doubt at the end of it, there were, there were bits that, I remember when I was doing the editing of the full volumes and checking whether what had been in the Blair years and thinking, God, why didn't I, why didn't I keep that in? And, yeah. and of course, I don't know the answer because I don't remember the process. And you have also obviously written a uh, fiction as well. Yeah. Um, uh, is that a different process then? You know, is that the more sort of traditional sit down, have a plan, outline, all that sort of stuff? It isn't with me. Um, the My first novel, All in the Mind, I mean, I never, there was never a point in my life when I thought, do you know what, I think I write novels. Mm -hmm. I actually had the idea for the novel as I was out riding my bike and I saw an event and at the time I'd been seeing a psychiatrist a lot because I'd, I'd been going through a very, very bad depression and I saw this event, it was a funeral and in my head I just started to imagine that it was, I don't know whose the funeral was because I just drove, I carried on mm -hmm. cycling going out mm -hmm. on the bike but as I carried on cycling I thought, I started to say to myself, that was a psychiatrist, that funeral. That was his funeral. And all those people who were there, they were all his patients. And I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if if they all told their story about him? Mm -hmm. And that was the genesis of the of the first novel. And then, so I didn't actually, when I started to write it, I didn't plan all the characters and I didn't even plan the, the story mm -hmm. because the ending of the story is totally different to how I started it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and bizarrely, you've got to read the novel to understand all this, but bizarrely, the the person who decided or decided me that the hero of the novel had to kill himself was my psychiatrist. <laughs> because <laughs> I showed him the book because it was about a psychiatrist mm -hmm. and also because he was somebody who knows this stuff inside out. And I wanted, I genuinely wanted his, his thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so the process, I started off really with four characters and I developed the other characters as I went. And I developed the, I had a rough sense of the arc. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the kind of driving personality was this psychiatrist and it then became about, his relationships with his patients and what you learn as you go through the book is that he's actually, you know, got in some ways far bigger issues than they have. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, so, and so that's how that one happened. And then that, that did pretty well. And then the second one, uh, was about, it was really about what I'd call the pathology of fame. And I've got, again, I've got no idea. I've got no idea where it came from. <laughs> got no idea where that idea came from why I wrote it. I mean, do you think that, um, you know, a lot of your books, um, fact, fact and fiction books have talked about mental health and these sorts of important issues. And when it comes to a uh, fiction book, is it is it almost easier to talk about these kind of issues and to get people to explore them or to follow them in ways they maybe wouldn't if it was a factual book? Well, I'll get to find that out because I've, I've written, the next book is a factual book. Mm -hmm. about depression mm -hmm. uh, which is out in September and but yeah I do think it I, I think that is I think if this is sort of if there was a driving impulse to do it right and as I say it wasn't planned if there was a driving impulse I think that was it I'd become somebody who likes to campaign on mental health likes mm -hmm. to argue for better services better awareness better understanding and you know, I, I can I'm, I can always get a platform. I can always get heard. I can I know how to get on the telly if I want to. I mean, mm -hmm. I can do all that. Um, but I think the novel did it did take that into a different space. 
and in some ways into a into a space that I could maybe reach people that wouldn't yeah. see me yeah. talk about mental health yeah. on breakfast television, but might read a novel. And um, you know, and I've been struck by the sorts of people that that you know that, and it wasn't a huge bestseller, but it did okay. And you know, but I've been, I, I've, you know, I still meet people who say, you know, I met, I met somebody a few weeks ago who, who there's one one of the characters in the in the book is she's a, a she, she's she's lost half her face in a fa- in a fire, and she that my again my personal psychiatrist David Sturgeon he he w- worked a lot with survivors of the King's Cross fire. Right. Okay. It was through talking to him about that that I sort of got into that. Anyway, I met this this woman who who said that you know she she she'd had a, a similar trauma. It wasn't a burns thing, but it was a it was an it's an accident that that disfigured her. And she said she just got so much out of reading what my fictional psychiatrist mm-hmm. did. Yeah. Help yeah. this other woman and and it's you know it's kind of nice when that happens and and I, I do think at heart all of my novels have have really been about mental health mm-hmm. at heart yeah um you know that the, they've not there's the one about fame and then I wrote one about um, an alcoholic teenager now where does that one come from I had a drink problem when I was younger I've got a son who's Thank God, seven years sober, but was an alcoholic very, very young. Um, and, you know, but I don't know where the idea came from. To, and, and again, it was about I t- the first the first line of the book is called My Name Is. And the first line of the book is My Name Is Hannah. This is their story. And then every chapter is then written by a different person. Mm-hmm. And she doesn't you don't hear her voice again until the very, very end. Mm-hmm. And so it starts with her mum and her dad, and her grandparents, and then, you know, to school friends. And it, so you go through her life, and then eventually it's, it's police, and it's drug rehabilitation mm-hmm. people, and it's prisons, and, you know, that's how you see her life. Yeah. And, and it's, but I guess that was like, if I boil down what is that story about, it's about the impact that one person's drink problem has on this yeah. massive mm-hmm. collection of people. Mm-hmm. Now, Again, I'm only guessing. I'm assuming that sort of came out of my own and my son's experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I don't know that. Mm-hmm. And you're, as you mentioned, you've got Living Better coming out in September. Yeah. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that and and why you've written that one? Um, well, I did a documentary for the BBC a couple of years ago about depression, where I went and looked at different ways that other people were dealing with depression. I talked a lot about my own, and I think part of the motivation was that when I, I thought the film was good and I was really pleased with it, mm-hmm. but you know, like, so for example, I mentioned my psychiatrist, mm-hmm. I did, it is a, it was a big thing for him to do, right? He, he sort of outed himself on camera as my psychiatrist and we had a chat on camera about an hour and a half long. Mm-hmm. It made about 10 seconds in the documentary. Um, I did some interviews with people that went over hours and, you know, they have to edit it. I get that. Yeah. Yeah. I did a very, very, very good job, but it meant that I had, I had all this stuff there Yeah. that I thought I still, you know, thinking in ink, I thought it was really interesting. So actually I just thought, why don't I take that and then shape it into a, a bigger, broader, deeper narrative than was possible with the film. Hmm. Um, and, and it's become it's become something very very different to the film because it's become much more personal. I've written a lot more about. Again, I'm I'm somebody I'm very open, and I don't mind talking about my mental health and stuff that I go through. But so, for example, when I'm depressed, I find it very hard to speak. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I can write about that much better than I can speak yeah. about it when I'm yeah. in that when I'm in that state. And so I've written. You know, there's, there's there's a chapter about when I kind of I mark my depressions out of ten, and I explain what the kind of the gradations are, and you know I think there are parts of it that people will be, you know, maybe a bit shocked by because I, you know, I've had suicide in my family, um, and I I, I I I have had a lot of experience of, of suicidal ideation, and, and I, you know, I go into some detail about what that is. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. what that entails and what my what is going through my mind and and so it's become a, a kind of I don't know it's different again it's the process isn't it it's like everything evolves and and the, the the other thing that I think people will find interesting Fiona my partner she's written a chapter at the end of the book about what it's like living with somebody else's depression mm-hmm. when you don't get depression Fiona doesn't get depression and um and that was the final word but because the book got delayed I've now written an extra chapter about mental health <laughs> so <laughs> Fiona's chapter ends with when we first met, there's no way he would have let me have the final word. <laughs> and you do it. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it sounds to me that your writing is quite cathartic in a way. Um, oh, yeah. And, and it, is there a fear um, when you're writing something like that about opening yourself up in a manner? And, and was there a point when you had to say to yourself, you know, that it's more important that I open myself up and that I write than it is to keep it hidden? I think, funny enough, I think the the moment on that came when I made I made another documentary years ago, a few years ago now, about my breakdown in the eighties, which was up in in Paisley. In um, I was in hospital in Paisley. Happy it happened in in Hamilton, and uh, it wasn't Hamilton's fault, by the way. I'm not I'm not <laughs> in Hamilton. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful place, uh, one of the best named football teams on the planet. Um, <laughs> But the so I did this documentary, and yeah, you know, I mean, I'm, I'll be I'll be honest. Fiona was she was like, why do you want to do this? Why are you doing this? Why are you putting yourself through this again? Why are you reliving it? Why are you doing that? And but again, it's back to the thing about I, I felt the, I really felt the impulse to do it. I felt the need to do it, and I did, and that did feel genuinely. I, I felt I sort of felt relieved that mm-hmm. I'd done that. And then, right, you know, obviously around it, there was quite a lot of publicity and what have you. And and then I had a brother, Donald, who died a, a few years ago. Now he had schizophrenia, and he was he was always a big part of this for me for the sort of campaigning on mental health. Um, and I just started to write about it more and more and more. And the thing is, I've I'm very very well aware of the stigma that's attached to mental health and mental illness, but I've never felt it myself. Mm-hmm. I've never felt it, but and I think the reason I've felt never felt it is because I've never felt ashamed about having had a breakdown. Um, I've, I feel ashamed about some of the things that I did mm-hmm. when I was out of control, and I feel some of the thing about some of the things I said, and I feel you know, and I wish I hadn't kind of hurt people that I did, and I wish I hadn't drunk as much as I did, and all that. But I don't feel ashamed of the fact that I had a psychotic breakdown, and I don't feel ashamed of the fact that I get depression. I feel very I'm actually quite proud of the fact that I'm, you know, I had a really bad bout recently and I got through it. And I, whenever I get through it, I think, you know, <laughs> give yourself a pat on the back. You've done it again. Yeah. You see it yeah. <laughs> and so, um, but the writing is incredibly cathartic. And, um, you know, and, and the thing I have to watch, I've, I've, this, this is partly what I wrote about the piece for Tortoise, where I, I talked to different people about how they were coping with in lockdown. And, and it was it was interesting because... Um, I've been putting the videos out online on my, you know, on a series of YouTube videos, and people that I thought would have coped really well didn't, and people I thought would have collapsed didn't. They coped really well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll give you know, a couple of examples. Kelly Holmes, who I know really well and really like, I think she's great. And you know, she's like me; she's got quite a history of mental ill health. And I thought she'd really struggle. She says she's found a whole new purpose in life. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's she's buzzing. Um, Jeff Stelling, the Sky Sports presenter, mm-hmm. I'm putting his video up tomorrow. I think he, he, um, I thought he'd be because I mean, even though I know him quite well, basically he's the character that I see on TV. He's yeah. enthusiastic, yeah. he's lively, he's always happy, and he was really, really struggling. And I could tell he was struggling even before he told me he was struggling. And so I, you know, wrote this this piece. And at the time, I thought maybe there's a book in this you know, mental health and lockdown. Mm-hmm. And maybe there is one time, but actually this is the great thing now about, you know, it actually found the right place. I wrote a 9,000 word piece for Tortoise. They did a really good podcast on it. Um, and it's not a book. Whereas I feel that with The Living Better, I think it is a book, mm-hmm. 
And I think it's actually quite a big book and quite an important book. I know everybody says that about their own books, but I think it's going to come at the right time. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I really worry that mental health is going to go back to the bottom of the queue again. Mm. Yeah. Back, back of the queue. Um, so I'm, you know, look, it's going to be different because, you know, the plans we had for May were big festivals and big events and, you know, sold out venues and all that stuff. Well, that's not going to happen. It's going to be very, very different sort of launch. But the themes I think are going to be are going to be as important and, and, and if not more important with COVID. Mm -hmm. And when you're writing a book like that, I wanted to ask about, um, you know your response to edits and things like that i mean are, are you someone that is uh you know are you happy to get notes or, or edits or are you quite stubborn about things that you want kept uh, and does it differ on you know differ in a book like living better as opposed to a book of fiction the first my first novel i think it all, i think it all depends on the relationship mm -hmm. um and i've had i've had good and i've had bad the, the first novel, uh, I had an editor called Rebecca Carter, and it took a while. It took a while, but I got to a place where I thought, hmm, her ideas are more bad than, uh, more good than bad. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I'm going to, my instinct is going to be to listen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Didn't mean that I did everything. And I mean, for example, the end, the, the very end of the book, she didn't like, she wanted me to change it, but no, I wasn't having it. I, I liked it. Mm -hmm. um, but other parts, she did some really big restructuring, yeah, which I liked. Um, the other one, my, the book on winners, I had a guy called Nigel Wilcox in a random house. He, again, uh, I, I, wrote, I did that book with my son. And uh, he, my son, Rory, he's, he was maybe you know less experienced than me with dealing with these sort of, you know, people who want to change things. I mean, Rory's like, oh, tell him to fuck off. And, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and he, he, again, was somebody who had, I thought, good ideas. And therefore, I would, you know, willingly buy in. And I think it's all about the relationship. Funny enough, the Living Better book has been, the process has been really good. Mm -hmm. um, they, and, 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 and I think it's that sense of, <laughs> maybe they made fewer suggestions for changes so that may, maybe <laughs> it's more than actually i think i think all you want if you're writing a book is you want you want i mean my daughter's working on a book at the moment and she had a bit of a flare up with with the publisher and the editor because she, she sort of i think you've got to understand the change that's being proposed mm -hmm. and, and that again i think is about the relationship that you develop and you know, I've had I've had bad experiences. I've had I've had um, a couple of times where I've said, look, you know, I don't think this is going to work. Mm -hmm. I think you have to be honest about that sometimes. Um, but and that's about the personal relationship. Mm -hmm. Whatever that's. Yeah. And I have to ask because it sounds like you're just you you're writing so much these days, and you're still uh, editor at large for the New European, and you're writing all the columns for that. You know, how do you find the time to? To, to fit all the writing in. I know obviously COVID's helped with that, but but you know, how do you what's your day like? How do you how do you find the time? Um see where, well, something like the New European. So I know I have to do that every week. Mm -hmm. So part of my mind will be worrying about worrying about that, you know, on and off most days. But once I've decided what I'm going to write, it doesn't take me long. Um i d I've always written very, very fast. Okay. Um and I'm, I'm also I'm very good at writing on the move. I like writing on trains. I like writing on planes. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing with the you know, and here's the other thing where the mental health stuffs kind of you know has its upsides as well as its downsides. Literally, is that you know when I'm kind of on the manic end of the spectrum, I've just got so much energy and I don't sleep and I get up at three in the morning and I just you know, start banging away. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now that can be dangerous on one level, but you know, I, I, I like to think that including in politics, that some of the best stuff I've ever written has been either when I'm a bit manic or when I'm coming out of a depression. Okay. Um, you know, and I think that sense of, and I think knowing when those moments are coming is important. So like, for example, today I went out on the bike, um, 
and I went out for quite a long ride. Um, but I had this idea for a, for a piece that I, you know, and I could have just sort of logged it, but actually I just, I just stopped and sat down at a cafe and I just banged it out on the phone for about half. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I came back and I rewrote it when I got home, but you know, total amount of work for that was, it was 1200 words. It was for the article website and it probably an hour. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I suppose it's just about trying to use every moment you can. Just you know, there's always you can always find ways to fit a bit of writing into your day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And 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 so, like for example, you know, my football's important to me, and one of my novels is about football. But like going to Burnley, that's a four-hour train journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for a home game. You know, in the days when we could go to home games, and <laughs> so uh, part of me through the week is thinking, well, what am I going to write on the train? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so if I've got a book on the go, that's pretty obvious. But even if I haven't, I'm thinking New European. I'm thinking a GQ interview. I'm thinking something I want to write. I'm thinking you know whatever. So it's just like yeah, I've I've I've, I've always been lucky like that. I've 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 uh, I've always had a, the capacity to to write a lot quickly. Um, and I think you know, for example, whenever somebody says to me, you know, oh, I'm thinking of writing a book and I'm, I've started to write a book and, um, you know, what advice have you got? And of course, it's very different because we're all, we've all got our own little ways. Yeah. But I always say, I think the most important thing to do is get the vomit on the page. Yeah. And that is just like, you know, whatever's in your head, whatever you think it might be about, just write it. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter how it looks. It doesn't matter if it doesn't work. Just whatever you think it is, get it out of there. And I'm a little bit like that. So, so that's my journalistic approach, the Marilyn Monroe thinking ink. Mm-hmm. That's a bit different. That's when I'm that. That's where I get to when I'm when I'm ordering it. Mm-hmm. But at the start, so like you know, that, like I say, with my first novel, I just I didn't tell anybody, including Fiona. I didn't tell anybody I was working on it until I'd finished. Until I'd finished it. Right. I was just disappearing up to the top of the house or I was going on train journeys or I was buzzing about the place. I was writing it and every spare moment I had, I was, I was thinking about it. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I don't know if you guys get this. I'll tell you what I love is when you wake up in the middle of the night with a thought that's about something you've been working on. Yeah. Yeah to write that you're writing or i'll give you another example that the 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 novel i mentioned with the with the with the suicide scene and the suicide you know suicide is a difficult kind of subject and you've got to be careful about it and and i I spent ages i couldn't work out how this guy was going to die and anyway i was i was driving from london to burnley and i had to pick my son up on the way in, or I was meeting him. I was meeting him on the way to pick him up and go to the game. And the idea for how this guy was going to die came to me on the M6 as I was, I was going through Keel, and it came to me. And I pulled off and I went in the service station, and I sat in the car in the car park on my BlackBerry. We had a Blackberry then, and I wrote this scene. And two things to tell you. The first is, I was, three things to tell you. The first is, two-thirds of the way through, I realized I was crying, right? And I realized I must have been crying for a while because there were tears dropping on my hands that were writing. So I'm totally in the whatever yeah. it is I'm in. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm killing this character that I've created. The second thing is that bit of the book, not a word of it changed in the editing process. Mm. And the third thing to tell you is my son phoned about an hour later and said, where the fuck are you? <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting for you. So I got completely sort of... And that, that had been a block for weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. No, it is, it is that it's true that when you get suddenly that moment, that thought hits you about how to fix something in the story you're trying to tell is 
it is an amazing moment and you do want to suddenly get to a bit of paper or computer and get it down as quickly as possible because your mind's obviously is working out isn't it in the background and so just in it quietly the background is working it through and suddenly it just throws it to the front of your brain and you think that's how it's going to work yeah mm-hmm. and i think things like structure as well it's like for the, for the living better book you know getting a structure and you know where do you when you're weaving in really personal stuff with kind of scientific research and um you know how do you how do you change the tone how do you move gear mm-hmm. to go from i'm telling you here about somebody in my family who killed himself and now moving to a scientist who thinks that antidepressants are really bad for you mm-hmm. right? how, how, how do you sort of frame that and and that sometimes is, it might be a linking thing, but sometimes it's structural. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you think actually, well, and, and what I've done in the end with the book is it's almost like I've written, it's almost, it's, it's like in two halves. It's like very, very, the, the story, the, I mean, the personal story weaves in and out, but I've almost like put a part where I've gone, right, this is me and this is the issue and here's the stuff that yeah. I've learned about. And um, yeah, and it's great when you get those. And, you know, you were pointing earlier about how, I, I don't mind. I, I'm very, very happy to get good thoughts and good ideas from other people, mm-hmm. you know. And I regularly, every book I've ever written, I've always sent it. There's three or four people out there who are not publishers and they're not journalists and they're 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 friends and they're people I know. And I send it to them, say, "What do you think?" Mm-hmm. And they always have good ideas. Yeah. And so, so what is you've got Living Better coming out in September? You, I think you said you'd finished another novel. What what is in the pipeline it sounds like a lot but <laughs> well another volume of diaries that are done yep uh we're going to come out in september but they've now been knocked back to next year right because i didn't want to bring them out at the same time as living better uh the novel it's interesting because i really like it but my agent's not 100 percent convinced <laughs> uh, which and that's an interesting dynamic yeah yeah because he basically says, you know, look, I can take it out to the market, but I'm, I think you need to do something a bit different. And then, uh, and I think it's because maybe he doesn't quite get what it's about. But then, but that, you know, he's, I, I respect his view. Mm-hmm. I've sent it to other people who love it. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm in a bit of a quandary about that one. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the process where I say, well, I've got two books coming out anyway. I can park that for a while. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there might be another, I think out of the mental health book might be another one mm-hmm. uh, that might be more specifically related to lockdown. Um, I had a, um, I took part in, in a conference the other day um, about mental health in lockdown. Mm-hmm. And, you know, again, where do ideas come from? And there was a, a Spanish um Psychi- she's an academic psychiatrist and scientist and she was saying how our brains literally change shape when we're subject to certain pressures that we don't expect so for example we're talking about children who are you know children when we when, when you and I were were growing up you know hugging people was like kind of what you did and mm-hmm. you saw your parents you went and hugged you saw your grandparents mm-hmm. you saw your friends and and now we're telling them oh no you mustn't touch people yeah. And you've got to wash your hands and you've got to, you know, you've got to wear a mask and all this sort of stuff. She says, that will actually change the shape of our brains. Okay. Uh-huh. And I thought, that's interesting. And then anyway, I was driving back from it and I thought, God, brain changer. That's a good title. <laughs> 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 I thought, brain changer. Yeah, because we're a gay brain changer. So, and I don't know, there might be a book in that. Yeah. Somewhere down there. <laughs> can you see know, that. How so, have our, yeah. our brains changed? And then I had another, um, you mentioned the New European. I wrote my column last week about, uh, I wrote a column at the start of lockdown, 20 things I miss in lockdown. Mm-hmm. And um, number one was Burnley. Number two was swimming in the Lido. Number four was abroad. Number six was France. And number 20 was La Bise, the little double kiss on the cheeks <laughs> so i thought will coronavirus kill labies mm-hmm. and anyway got to france we got some friends who live nearby went to see them and as we went up to 
say hello. They both went, oh, no, no, pas de bees, pas de bees, pas de bees. La bise, c'est fini. <laughs> and I thought, wow, he has killed the bees, yeah. right? <laughs> so I've written a piece for this week's New European, and I think there's a book in it. <laughs> because I've, I've done a little bit, a bit of research, and the, the last, the history of la bise is just incredible. Mm-hmm. It's got a whole story that goes through the Middle Ages. It goes into, it, it, it's got a big role in the French Revolution because égalité, fraternité, the kiss on the cheek was a sign of saying we are on the level. All right, okay. All right, the okay. Same, we're the same level. And do you know the time that, and also after the First World War, um, the masses started to rediscover la bise in part a protest against the lions led by donkeys, the, the, the donkeys, the, the high society people, mm-hmm. with their, their, their sort of patronizing hand kissing. Mm-hmm. So they can have their hand kissing, we're going to do get yeah. by the beast. And the reason why it died out from the Middle Ages, do you know what it was? No. What? It was the Black Death. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it was the pandemic. So, so I thought, oh, that could be a book. And then I've got, um, yeah, so these are all, you know, brain changer that it may never, they may never happen. But what will happen, my, what happens with me in my, the process, this happened with Living Better is that suddenly I thought, yeah, I'm going to turn that into a book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when I decide that, I just do it and I do it very, very full on. So one of these ideas that percolates away, whether it's the novel, the novel's about, um, and it is probably dated already because of because of COVID. Mm-hmm. There's going to be so many COVID novels. I'm not going to make it about COVID, but it's actually about it's the story of a, a military guy, ex special forces, or his current special forces, but he's on the run for a crime that he's committed, mm-hmm. um, where he's basically he's, he's he's really badly he's discovered his wife's playing away. Mm-hmm. He really badly beats up the guy. Uh, he's in real trouble. He goes on the run. He ends up sleeping on the streets, and he meets this very, very, very rich wife of a French banker living in London. And it's the it's the story of their kind of this really strange relationship mm-hmm. that develops between them. And I really, really like it. Mm-hmm. Uh, my, my agent says the problem <laughs> is it's the old what genre is it right? <laughs> yeah. i would say it. i don't care what genre it is i like the story <laughs> so so i think i'll i'll i will redo it though because i take his opinion seriously mm. so I'll, I'll definitely redo that i'm in no rush on it um but one of the others will become a book i just don't know what it will be uh, and do you write these ideas down or do you just let them sit in your head and just let the best ones sort of come to the front of your thinking I do both. I do both. Right. Okay. So I do. I do write them down. Um, and I'll give you another one. That, and it's it's amazing how stuff just comes at you. That so, I did a podcast which was out the other day um, with a guy called Nick Keller, who he runs something called Beyond Sport. Yeah. He runs the Sport Industry Awards, and Beyond Sport is a thing where it's how sport is used for social good. And he anyway, like everybody, he's in lockdown. His business, you know, he does big sporting events, right? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. there weren't any of that. And so he decided to do a podcast. And his podcast is called uh, Life Beyond Sport, and it's an interview format. Mm-hmm. And he asked me to do it, and I did it. And he said, the thing you've got to bring to the, t- to the interview, three sporting moments that define your life. Mm-hmm. Right? That's a good idea. And I'd say it's one of the hardest things I've ever done. <laughs> And what I realized, thinking in ink, I wrote out all the possibles, and I had hundreds. Yeah. I had hundreds. And I thought, well, I wonder if there's a book about, you know, <laughs> all, all my great moments in sport. <laughs> and the other, the, other one, the other one that I've had is I've become obsessed about trees in the last... <laughs> yeah, your tree of the day. I've seen this. this. Yeah, yeah there's, there's, there's a book in this. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know which of these will, will percolate. Brilliant. Excellent. Um, what was the last film you saw? 
do you mean film in the cinema or film? Well, a, a movie. I mean, a, 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 a movie, the, but whether it's in the cinema or on TV, what, what was the last one you watched? Oh, God, what did we go and see recently? When the cinema came back. God, it can't have been that good. <laughs> Am I allowed to go and ask Fiona? Fiona! <laughs> she's out, she's out. Um, got it, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. It was the um, Tom Hanks um, about the TV presenter. Oh, yeah. Oh, people did in the neighbourhood? Mr Rogers one? Mr Rogers, yeah. 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 Any yeah. good? I thought I thought it was brilliant. It's, that's terrible. I couldn't remember it. I thought, <laughs> he is unbelievable. In it. I've heard he's really good in it. Yeah. Oh no, I couldn't remember that. I think it might be. It was a weird sort of setup. Mm -hmm. well, it, the... It's a it's a funny movie. That, it's a movie that I've seen it, and I know Tom Hanks will be great in it. But it, it it's not something that I've ever thought. Oh, I need to go and watch that. But yeah. No, um, I, I what I thought was it was one of those films that. Um, I came out and wanted me. I didn't really know much about the story, and I wanted to immediately go away and look at the story. And I was amazed that it was true. Mm -hmm. And when you see the guy, there was something sort of slightly weird about the character, and he thought that he must be kind of exaggerating this, but he wasn't yeah. at all. No, so that was that was the last film. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, what about the last book that you read? I'm going to show off now <laughs> a little bit. The last book I read, which I finished last night, is called Die Tauschung. Okay. By nice. Charlotte the French Le book? German. German. Nice. Yeah. And I, in lockdown, my birthday fell in lockdown, and Fiona, who I'm not an easy person to buy presents for because I'm not technical and I'm not into clothes and I'm not sort of into big possessions, mm -hmm. She, but she bought me a advanced German course at the Goethe Institute. All right. Nice. Uh, which I really, really enjoyed. And I I picked, I thought, am I ready yet to, to, to read a big 500-page mm -hmm. novel? So I picked up this book, Die Täuschung, which means The Deception. Um, I need to check her out because I don't know whether – I know she's incredibly successful mm – -hmm. mm -hmm. You know, number one bestsellers all over Germany. You know, her German, her, and she's huge in Germany. Mm -hmm. But I don't know whether she's like Jeffrey Archer or yeah. Henry Mantel or kind of yeah. I don't know where she's on that radar. Um, and I've just this afternoon, funny, I finished it last night. And as I've been reading it, I've been underlining all the words that I didn't understand. And I'm now going through Google Translate to. But but were you still able to get a feel for what the novel was? Oh you yeah, totally. Yeah. No, I was really I was very very pleased that I could I could understand the story, mm -hmm. and it was brilliantly done. I have to say, it really was. The, I mean, as a as a the plotting was incredibly well mm -hmm. done. Yeah, brilliant. And uh, what what was the last TV show or TV series that you have watched or are watching? Uh, Fowder. Found. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. On Netflix is that I think. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I've not the seen last, that. the last non-fiction I watched was the Hillary Clinton series, which was unbelievably depressing because uh, she should have, yeah. because she should have won. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The world might be very different. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and then the very last thing that we always do is a sort of either or thing so there's no right answer just whatever okay. you want to pick so um, I'll start with uh, Burnley to win the Premiership or Scotland to win the World Cup <laughs> oh oh that is so hard <laughs> that is so hard I'm going to go Burnley. Okay. Oh, Fair enough. Brutal. Probably uh, more I'm... chance of it, I have to say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go for a, a much easier one. Uh, real book or e-book? Real book. Fair enough. Uh, Definitely. I've never got into the e-book thing. Uh, got into audio books. Yeah, I quite like yeah, an audio book. Like yeah, I quite like a yeah. long drive. Yeah. I'll tell you what we listened to on the on the way down, uh, driving down through, through France, was Billy Connolly's Made in Scotland. Oh, oh brilliant. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I honestly thought at one point I was I was driving and thinking, if I crashed, 
would it be dr- dangerous driving that you're fucking laughing your head off? <laughs> um, uh, TV or cinema? Cinema. A uh, fancy restaurant or a takeaway? Oh, restaurant doesn't have to be fancy. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Especially at the moment, I think. Um, yeah. And uh, last one, controversial, but uh, Johnson or Trump? <sighs> That's horrible. <laughs> I know, I know. It's a difficult. Um, uh, there may not be an answer to that one. I think, I think marginally Johnson because I, I, I think Trump actually is. I think I mean Johnson. I don't think believes things, and, and, and but I think he has deep down a desire to be liked, and I think he's shown that he'll you know he'll do whatever it takes, which is is bad on one level. But I think it means that he he won't. Yeah, I think he's going to be quite as outlandish as Trump. Whereas I think I think Trump is a real real menace to the world. And I think that you know I I did a, one of my GQ interviews with Tony Blair a while. This is ages ago now. Mm-hmm. And and I and I said to him, I said, listen, do you not worry that there are just too many parallels between now and the thirties? And he said, oh, stop this nonsense you've got about Hitler and Trump. <laughs> Right, <laughs> but you know, you see what's happening in Portland today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, the 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 and the, the the one thing I'd say why I really worry about about Johnson is that I think Trump's worse, but what I'd say about all of these people is that they get away with the little things, and it empowers, makes them feel empowered to get away with the big things. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think they're both dangerous. But as things stand today, if my life depended on saying which did I like the least, which did I despise the most, Trump just nicks it. Okay, that's fair enough. (laughs) (laughs) So Burnley over Scotland, I'm not sure how that will go down. In Scotland, I have to say. <laughs> Burnley, I believe, are some kind of basketball team. Yeah, I knew you'd like that question, Tarek. You, you, you do know what the World Cup is, the, the other half of the yes, question. Yes, yes, yeah. I'm just not a big golfer. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I thought that was a, I thought that was a really interesting chat with, with Alistair there. Yeah, um, yeah. Super it, nice guy. It's, it's amazing, actually, how much, you know, how important writing is in his life. It's maybe not something... Mm-hmm. When people think of him, they'll think politics first, I think. But writing has been the the sort of throughput in everything that he's done throughout his life. Yeah. And I just thought it was really interesting how he's been able to use that in in the work in politics, but also afterwards in journalism and in writing these, these other books that we chatted about. And Living Better really does sound like an important book. Um, not just for him. I think it was a cathartic process, as you said, obviously. But yeah, um, I think these books are. It is important to talk about these issues and get them out there so that people don't have that stigma about it. I think. I think that's absolutely right. I think you hit the nail on the head. Keeping all this stuff inside is an unspoken is never a good thing. And I think the more people normalize the discussion about these these issues, you know, that's only a good thing. So yeah, it's a really interesting chat. Um, yeah, and, and I think he, for me, he's certainly done a lot more writing than I had realised, mm-hmm. which was which was excellent to learn. Yeah, and the, the whole thing of thinking in ink and all of that stuff, it's it's interesting that that's his whole approach to everything, you know, and that's how he how he gets gets these things done. So thanks so much, Dancer, for taking the time to come on the podcast and speak to us about that. Um, we do recommend that you do check out Living Better because it is, as we say, a very important book and uh, a very good one as well. So uh, do and check. it's out. It is out. Time of recording yesterday. Yes, that's right. Uh, 3rd of September it, w- it was released. So yeah, you can grab a copy of that now. Um, uh, next week, we also have another great guest. We do. Lauren Bukas is on next week, who is uh, the author perhaps best known for The Shining Girls. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was a kind of big success, international success. Uh, she's done a number of other great books. She's got a brand new book 
Afterland, which was just out yesterday as well. I think so, um, yeah. And uh, it's a really, really fun chat we have with her. She's a really good laugh. Yeah, no, she's a really great, great laugh. And also, again, fascinating to hear about her process and how she went f- from writing, you know, quite sm- small time writing essentially in South Africa and how she s- managed to get that international success with the shining girls and that's really changed her life i think uh, yeah, the success yeah. Of that. and, and a, a, another person who kind of you know you seize that opportunity and you and you build on it as it happens you create your own luck a little bit yeah. so, so lots of really good advice from her next week yeah definitely so yeah uh, do tune in for that one well i hope you enjoyed that episode if you did please leave a comment down below hit that thumbs up button and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK page one, as evidenced here. And our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later. Mm-hmm.